Καλησπέρα σε όλου. Πριν από ένα χρόνο, στον κόλπο του Μεξικού, από μια κατεστραμμένη πετρελαιοπηγή τη ΠΠ, διέρευσαν στον ωκεανό 5 εκατομμύρια βαρέλια αργού γλυκού πετρελαίου τη Λουιζιάν. Οι Αμερικανικέ Ομοσπονδιακέ Υπηρεσίε και η ΠΠ κινητοποίησαν αμέσω ένα στρατό απορριπαντικών συνεργείων και χρησιμοποίησαν τότε 14 εκατομμύρια λίτρα χημικών διαλυτικών για να εμποδίσουν το πετρέλαιο να φτάσει στι ακτέ. Το κακό όμω έγινε. Την περασμένη εβδομάδα είδαμε πώ αντιμετωπίστηκε η καταστροφή αλλά και οι επιπτώσει τη στο περιβάλλον. Σήμερα τόσο η BP όσο και οι Αμερικανικέ Ομοσπονδιακέ Υπηρεσίε υποστηρίζουν ότι το πετρέλαιο, τα διαλυτικά, η μόλυνση έχουν περιοριστεί σχεδόν 100%. Έχουν εξαφανιστεί. Απόψε στην εμπόλεμη ζώνη, στο δεύτερο μέρο του νέου μα ντοκιμαντέρ, άνθρωποι με υψηλά ποσοστά καρκινογόνων ουσιών στο αίμα του και ανεξάρτητοι ερευνητέ με στοιχεία σοκ για τη μόλυνση στη διατροφική αλυσίδα, αποκαλύπτουν μια τελείως διαφορετική εικόνα για τη μεγαλύτερη διαρροή πετρελαίου στον ωκεανό στην ιστορία της ανθρωπότητας. You won't meet too many people who live in Grand Isle who don't have health issues because of this. I think most of the common complaints, uh, during the summer we had a lot of burning eyes, burning nose, burning ears, headaches, nausea, uh, fatigue, um, a hacking cough. And now we're hearing more reports of this hacking cough keep coming back and back again. And yet the United States government and BP doesn't recognize claims that this has anything to do with the oil. The problem is, and you'll, you'll see this again and again and again, in, in coastal communities like this, a lot of people are scared. A lot of doctors are scared. Uh, there's a test to test people's blood. It's called a Metamatrix test. A uh, doctor has to order this test. Insofar, most doctors have been reluctant to order this test. So you have people Why? being... People are scared. They're scared of BP. Scared of what? You know, the what, be, what BP will do to them? Louisiana is run, I mean the state is run as an energy state. And so we're talking from the from the bottom to the top, this state is run really by energy concerns. It's run by the petrochemical industry. So there's a lot of fear here in trying to take on this industry. And I think a lot of doctors are afraid of that. Um, we have Wilma Super wants to losing their job. Losing their What job or or even more serious. Wilma Super was shot at. <laughs> Uh, you know, she was in her lab and was shot at. The ones that are severely, severely impacted, the ones that are urinating blood, we have some incidence of um, leukemia, which is caused by benzene, which is a known component of the BP crude. And we found as much as 10 times the normal level in their blood. Three months, I couldn't see in light at all. My eyes were completely, would contract in light where I couldn't even see in a 40 watt lamp bulb. I have internal bleeding right now. A friend of mine who I dove with on every occasion has the same levels as I do. Um, he's, it, it's coming out of his nose every day and it's coming out of his balls every day. I just have it coming out of my bottles every day. Were there other leaks? How much oil is that leak?
I feel like I'm witnessing a really horrible nightmare in the history of the Gulf. I mean, there's some people who feel that it'll be the end of some of our communities. From the day the spill happened, the explosion happened, we've been monitoring the situation, working with the agencies, evaluating what, what information was flowing in. We have a large number with health impacts, and when they go to their doctor, if they have enough money to go to their doctor, the doctors say, oh, it's just infected sinuses, oh, you've got chemical pneumonia, and they'll give them antibiotics and then just dismiss them, and they don't want to say, it might be associated. One may say, how can you be so sure that these people are sick because of the BB oil? The only difference in their life is they've been exposed to the BP oil and the dispersants. So my cohorts in all this effort I'll be talking to you about today are members of Louisiana Environmental Action Network, Mary Dior, stand up Mary Dior, is the executive director. After the initial catastrophe, we started getting calls about health problems from the oil spill. What kind of problems? Respiratory problems at the very beginning. Um, you know they were doing the, what they called in situ burning, which was burning on the water. Also when the air would blow off of the slick, when it would blow towards the communities, like uh, our folks would have trouble with their asthma, they would have to increase their medication, or people who didn't have any respiratory problems before were calling and saying, something doesn't smell right, I'm having difficulty breathing. Can you estimate how many people were affected by this? I wish I knew the answer to that. My fear is so many people, I, I, I don't even know, I, many, many, many people. I mean, every day I get more and more calls from people who feel like their life has been changed because of this bill. And why do we don't have official data on this? You know, that's the, a, an excellent question. Why don't we have official data on this? Why is a little nonprofit like Lean being out there, the only independent testing that I know of, of the, the soil, the water, the sediment, and then the biota, the seafood. We've been testing since August. Nobody else has been testing. We've been doing blood testing for volatile solvents. The BP crude and the dispersant have volatile solvents in them. The benzene, the ethyl benzene, the xylene, and the hexane correspond to what we're finding in the air and what's in the dispersant and the crude. And these chemicals are found in the blood. Individuals with the highest of these chemicals in the blood was a male diver who reported diving through the crude slick. He's 47 years old. He had epilbenzene 5.6 times acceptable, xylene 5.68 times, he had hexane, he had 2-methylpentane, he had 3-methylpentane, he had isooctane. Then we have a 10-year-old male, his family of rappers. He had 2-methylpentane, the highest of any samples we have today. 3-methylpentane, the highest of any samples today. The isooctane, the benzene, the ethylbenzene, the xylene, and the hexane. Dead oil and dead birds, mammals, aquatic organisms, they're spread all along the wetlands and beaches. You saw it. Thursday of last week, 
this individual called and told me that he was confined to a wheelchair, paralyzed, was having seizures, had been to 10 to 12 different hospitals and doctor's offices, had MRIs, all kind of brain scans done, and they couldn't identify what his problem was. Wheelchair. His name is Paul Stewart, and Paul is from Navarre in Florida. Paul, do you have a microphone? I was recently affected um, in early June. Um, I, I was swimming in the water, doing everything a normal a normal teenager does do. In late June, I started. I, I had an onset of headaches and internal bleeding, which. I, I then referred myself to a hospital. The hospital really couldn't tell me much much of what was going on with me. They said all my labs were coming back normal and everything was good. They sent me on my, my way home. It didn't get better from there. It, it, it just got worse. Uh, my, my headaches started getting worse. I, I, I had constant dizziness. Um, On November 24th, I was going into the um, I was going in the Marines, and I there then went through my training, came home that day, and I, I had a headache, so I took I took some of the medicine the hospital prescribed. They said it they said it would be better within a few weeks. I go I went to lay down, and my chest started hurting. I started having numbness down my arm. I went to go find help. That's all I remember after that. I found, I woke up in a hospital. I couldn't move, I couldn't move my left arm. I couldn't move my left leg. I, I was basically paralyzed on the left side of my body. Now I'm co confined to a wheelchair. I'm, my, my daily life has been pretty much constricted to a, having multiple seizures. I, uncontrollable seizures. Um, I have to have somebody with me constantly. I, I can't I can't get a grip on myself. My I have a constant headache, constant spinning, um, vertigo. We came we came here today to for answers because I have I've been to 14 hospitals since November 24th. I've seen 93 doctors and no one can tell me what is going on with me. My name is James Miller. I'm a commercial fisherman in Bluffton, Mississippi. I'm white. It's a shame that we all go to this church here to wonder why we hear about health care. Since no, man, I'm really hurting everywhere. Couldn't explain why I was hurting everywhere. Every day I, I heard they're not taking care of us. And I'm sorry that we're here today to come here. God bless us. Yeah, God bless us. Catfish is one of the greatest warriors in this. I think what is he's 
having is a result of being exposed. Now, how do we remedy that situation is where we so desperately need medical professionals that know how to handle environmental exposure. I've had just tons of phone calls from people who lived along the, the beaches or people who went to the beaches on vacation. And in a lot of places there are hotels with swimming pools right on the beach. And then a lot of people who talked about they went swimming when like the officials in Mississippi told them it was all safe. And if the kids wore a white or a light color bathing suit, they'd come out all stained, stained black. The fact that an oil spill can cause health effects would not be news to anyone, I think, in France or in Spain. There's an enormous amount of information in those governments because they had a couple of years ago and, and like about a decade ago major oil spills on their coastlines and the hospitals documented thousands and thousands of people um, having problems and I'm sure there are innumerable government reports that were written in those countries about these things and nobody in the U.S. seemed to want to learn from what Europe had learned in these to prepare and apply that here in the Gulf. So suddenly we're now in a situation where it's almost a surprise that there are health effects from uh, the spill instead of reaching out to knowledge that exists in other countries who also have had oil spill experiences, recent ones. Κανεί δεν μπορεί να συνδέσει με απόλυτη βεβαιότητα τα προβλήματα υγεία κατοίκων του κόλπου με το πετρέλαιο τη BP. Στα νοσοκομεία, οι γιατροί είναι επιφυλακτικοί για πολλού λόγου. Ενώ η πολιτεία μόλι πρόσφατα έδωσε το πράσινο φω για μια μεγάλη έρευνα σε δεκάδε χιλιάδε εργάτε και εθελοντέ που συμμετείχαν στην επιχείρηση απορρίπανση. Η περίπτωση του 22χρονου Πολ Ντούμ ήταν μια από τι πιο αμφιλεγόμενε μέχρι την ημέρα που βγήκαν τα αποτελέσματα των τοξικολογικών του εξετάσεων. Το ίδιο ίσχυε και για την περίπτωση του δίτη στη Φκόλιαν που βούτυξε στον ωκεανό για να πάρει δείγματα της πετρελαιοκυλίδας και να βιντεοσκοπήσει τη μόλυνση 25 μίλια μακριά από το σημείο της διαρροής. Τα πιο ανησυχητικά στοιχεία όμως είναι τα αποτελέσματα των τεστ από ανεξάρτητους ερευνητές σε ψάρια, γαρίδες και άλλα θαλασσινά. My name is Brent Ballet. I'm a charter boat captain, uh, fisherman. I take uh, clients uh, fishing for redfish and speckled trout in our interior marshes here in South Louisiana. We're down South Pass, or coming down the South Pass of the Mississippi River, which is the furthest uh, south tip of Louisiana, the, basically the mouth of the Mississippi River. We're going down to see what the, the cleanup operations associated with the oil spill, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, and we're going to go out to the beaches and just uh, see what the guys are doing out there. What we have here is one of their staging areas, the, the, the big boats and stuff. They bring all the equipment down, bring all the cleanup people down. The oil, we're not so worried about. The oil, I don't think would have had much of an effect on our fisheries at all. The dispersants, on the other hand, that they sprayed on the oil was a little, is more toxic, may have, had, may have a little more or a lot more long-term uh, effect on the, on the, on the fish. We, we really don't know. We're down on the, uh, at the mouth of South Pass. Uh -huh. uh, this is one of the beaches that had gotten oil on it. And uh, here right now we're looking at all these big marsh buggies up on the beach and uh, excavators. And they're actually, they're digging down a foot, two feet down into the sand to find the layers of oil that have, have been covered back up by fresh sand. And that way they can, they can get the contaminated sand out. Did you work for BP as well? I did. 
I did for uh, six or seven months now. Uh, I'm not working for them anymore, but uh, we did we did a lot of work for them. What kind of work did you do? We did air monitoring. How did you do that? Uh, some type of little machines that that had different sensors in it that would they would detect different different stuff, different chemicals. This is one of the, one of the only spots that they actually had some uh, hydrogen sulfide gas that was uh, in the sand down here. So they really had to be careful when they were working in this area to, to stay away from the bad spots. Did you have to wear special suits or no, no. respirators or things like that? Nope, the air was, was good. No. I sat there and looked at the monitors and the little machines all day, every day while we were out here. And I didn't, didn't have anything for me to really worry about. It, you know, no whistles went off, no bells, no red flashing lights. It, it, uh, yeah, I feel like it was it was safe to breathe. Well, have I, you heard of, of any stories? I did. I did. Some of the some of the fishermen right after it happened uh, had some respiratory problems and, and stuff like that. And uh, uh, I I don't know. It was the air emissions from the dispersed oil that was made into an aerosol was severe from New Iberia, Louisiana, all the way through the panhandle of Florida. A large, large number of humans, the ones on the shore that were impacted by the aerosol that came in, who had absolutely nothing to do, they weren't fishers, they weren't workers doing the cleanup, um, all the way across the coast, uh, at least a million, maybe a million and a half people just on the coast, and then the workers is just like maybe five to six hundred thousand workers. And from the day one that they went out and were employed by BP or their contractors, they became ill by coming in contact with the crude and the dispersants. They're telling me they have rashes, they have uh, heart, they have chest pains, they have respiratory, burning eyes, skin that's all full of, of welts and blood in their urine, just a whole host of health impacts. And yet, they desperately need those jobs and they go back out to work. If you talk to the workers, they will say they were not allowed to wear protective gear or respirators because they didn't want it to look like the work they were doing and the chemicals they were in contact with were dangerous. I was one of the workers that actually worked with uh, volunteers. And I went through some of the training with BP. And um, it was quite interesting what they would tell us. And when we would be around leathered oil, that the um, percentage of uh, contaminants in the air were going to be low enough that we wouldn't need any protective gear. During the signing of the contract, in the small print, it was uh, stated that if you were seen or if you were purchased a respirator, you would be fired on the spot. Was it uh, a matter of bad image in the movie? Correct, correct. I think that they felt like if you have a respirator on in an area, then that there's a possible liability for them. If there's nothing on, then they're sending a message that everything is okay. So the price that people paid is I would get incredible calls from the fishermen who were out on vessels. They were vomiting. They were dizzy. They could hardly stand up. They had chest pains. They, it, it was unbelievable. They couldn't believe that they weren't provided with gear that would protect them. While I was working there, after about a week or so, I started having issues with my eyes. My eyes would water a lot, they would burn. I was very sensitive to light. I couldn't even see in a 40 watt lamp bulb. Did you see a doctor? Yeah, I actually did go see an eye doctor. I went to tell her exactly my symptoms and she goes, before I could answer, she said, well, were you working for BP? And I was like, well, yeah, how did you know? She's like, well, I've seen this before. This has been associated with fishermen or people that work in the oil business. 
you know other people that have similar or other kinds of problems? Yeah, recently I've come across some people that I'm friends with that have been telling me some chronical problems. One said he had the flu for three weeks like he's never had before. I'm regretful and hesitant to call him up and say, dude, you, you may have chemical pneumonia. My name is Steve Colian. I'm an environmental scientist. I'm the director and founder of EcoRigs.org. Prior to the spill, those platforms were just loaded with fish. Uh, they slowly started dying. Uh, on day 17 when we went out there, everything still looked pretty healthy. And then on day 90, uh, all those organisms started to show mortality. And, and when I would grab them, they would just fall right off. The, the pilings. Because of the lack of, of, of oxygen? It was pro no, it was probably the uh, I ingestion of uh, these uh, uh, toxic organic materials like uh, ethyl benzene. I have ethyl benzene in my body right now in a, 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 at a toxic level. How do you know that? When did you have the first symptoms? I have uh, been experiencing symptoms for about two, three months, and um, I, I just got my results back yesterday. And I'm about, uh, oh, three times greater than the danger threshold. So I, I, I've got to detoxify myself. I'm really high for ethyl benzene. And, uh, in your blood? Yes, in my blood. And I'm uh, very high for uh, uh, MP xylene. It's just a, a constituent of uh, Corexit and crude oil. Ethyl benzene is a carcinogenic. It uh, attacks the liver, the kidneys. Uh, I, I have internal bleeding right now. Um, a friend of mine who I dove with on every occasion has the same levels as I do. Um, he's, it, it's coming out of his nose every day and it's coming out of his balls every day. I just have it coming out of my balls every day. Some of the components of crude oil, um, individual components, are known human carcinogens, class one, if you will, uh, from IARC. And um, some examples would be uh, some of the volatile organic compounds, such as benzene. We know benzene causes leukemia, uh, a major cause of leukemia. Um, a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, benzoapyrene is an example, um, and others. Uh, the heavy metals such as arsenic and cadmium are contained in crude oil. Those are. Uh, class A human carcinogens. It, it came through my skin, it came through inhalation, I bre breathed it in, and then also one time I almost drowned up out there and I swallowed a bunch of it. Swallowed about a gallon of seawater and oil and dispersants. Are you scared? Yo, I am concerned. I'm very concerned, especially if my internal organs stop functioning. From what I understand, those uh, workers that the, in the Exxon Valdez spill uh, were exposed to the same um, compounds, and they experienced mortality on an average rate of three years after the after their uh, cleanup event. Just moved, moved down to the Florida area about two and a half years ago. I 
recently lived in Indiana, came down here just to, um, with my family. They, this was their dream home. I was swimming all summer. Um, I was doing, I was doing, li just basically living the beach life. I was going surfing every day. I was windsurfing. I was swimming in the ocean. I was, I was doing everything a young adult would would do. I was, I mean, I was always on the beach. I never felt anything in the water, but I did. I didn't smell the normal sea salt that comes off of the, um, comes off of the Gulf. We live, we live right on the beach, and when we would walk out on our back porch, all you would smell was chemicals. That's all you smelled. We would rush to the ER, and that doctor was the, that ER doctor was the first doctor to ever say that he, I needed to see a toxicologist. I don't want to say that I have I have no idea what could have caused these symptoms. I don't want to say that it's related to golf. I hope it's I hope and I pray that it's not related to the golf and these chemicals, because I do I do understand that there are they are neurotoxins and some neurotoxins cannot be reversed. But if it, if if it is related to the golf. At least I will have an answer because I, I've, I've seen 94 doctors in 14 di 15 different hospitals and I've, I've yet to have a result or answer to why I am in this condition. And hopefully with these tests, I, it will give me peace. It will give me peace to why I'm, I am at this now. When did you have this test? What kind of results did you get? I had this test approximately two weeks ago. I've, I've, I'm still awaiting the results for the test, and um, tomorrow I'm actually going to get the same test to back up those those first results. The acute effects have been reported. As of um, this past fall, there were about 400 uh, reports to the Office of Public Health here in Louisiana. So it was just Louisiana workers and um, and cleanup volunteers and they were mostly um, nausea injuries skin rashes respiratory effects very similar to what's been seen in the other spills that have been reported actually the number nationally who uh, who called in or were reported to NIOSH is larger than 400 it that was about um, a little over 2,000 people have been reported to NIOSH as having some sort of health effect. What about poison centers? Poison centers got um, phone calls um, nationally. A little over 1,500 uh, people called with uh, questions and concerns. Is it because of the oil or the dispersants or both? I, I don't think we know that. And the people who are calling in with concerns uh, don't have the answer either. They're 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 looking for answers, and that's why they're reporting it uh, through the public health system. It it could be from the dispersants or the oil or a combination. research on, on health effects? That's just beginning. We got a grant here at Louisiana State University to do a, a small study. We will interview and collect biologic samples from about uh, 2,000 women from the high-risk parishes along the Gulf Coastal states. But the larger study is being conducted directly by one of the NIH institutes in this case, it's the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And they will interview and collect specimens from a cohort of the men who were employed uh, as cleanup workers. And they hope to have a cohort and be able to follow them over time. And with 40 or 50,000 men, we are ultimately interested in, in diet, 
Uh, we know that the oil uh, didn't just uh, get on human beings' skin, it got on animals, it got in seafood, it got on plants, and so it certainly had the opportunity to enter the food chain. All the samples we took, as far as organisms, they were not visibly oiled. The sediment and the soil samples we took, a lot of them were visibly oiled. And so we analyzed them for the polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons, which were one of the main components of the BP crude, as well as the dispersant. We analyzed for volatile organics, and then we analyzed for heavy metals and petroleum hydrocarbons. The data on these soil and sediment and the data on the tissue actually match the fingerprint of the BP crude. So we knew we had samples that were contaminated from the BP crude. My name is Chris Shebley. I'm the uh, senior research biologist with the Ductile Research Laboratory at the University of New Orleans in the uh, Pontchartrain Institute for Environmental Sciences. And I conduct most of the, uh, the fisheries research operations uh, for the lab. And today we left our field research station, which is called the Coastal Education and Research Facility. And we traveled from uh, the east side of the lake, where the facility is, all the way to the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain. Uh, straight across from New Orleans. So in the distance, way over there, you can see the city. And uh, we're about 35 miles directly north of the city across the lake. Well, we just put out a 250-yard gill net. And uh, it's, a, it's called a strike method. So the net is out there. It's technically an eighth of a mile long. And what we do is we get some water quality parameters here and a uh, GPS location for the net, and then we're going to do what's called the strike method. We're going to drive the boat around it in three concentric circles in order to flush the fish that are happen to be there into the net. So if there are any in the immediate area, they get shot into the net, and then we back up on the net and, and pick the fish out. Um, and then the next step after that will be uh, a beach seine. We're going to get in the water for that, and then we're going to do a, a trawl, which is a scale modeled version of what the shrimpers use here for the, the shrimp uh, season. right along over here where those pilings are and end up on that beach right there and yeah, we should see some uh, some fish at that point so if y'all want to suit up get the waders on so you can hop in the water there's a whole bunch of sticks or whatever that is we haven't seen any direct noticeable changes in the, in the data so far because you know, towards the end of the summer we start to see this decline in numbers of fish anyway as we go into fall and through the winter. You'll see today we don't really get a lot of fish typically in the winter because the water's so cold. But as spring comes on and, and the warm-up happens, that's our recruitment. You can, you can tell exactly what month it is by what fish I pull up in these nets. This is one of the fish we we're kind of worried about reproducing with the oil spill. It's a, a Gulf Menhaden, or slang is a pogey, they call it. They get about this big, and they kind of look like a, a, a sardine um, when they get bigger. And this is basically a juvenile just past the larval stage of a pogey. This is the Gulf killifish, this one here with the stripes. And it gets about this big. The slang down here for it is a cockahoe minnow. It's a common bait minnow. So if these things are doing pretty well, that's a good thing because every one of the marinas sells these for fishing bait for people to go fishing with. And this here is called a sheep's head minnow. It's not a sheep's head, but they call it a sheep's head minnow. It actually has little teeth in its mouth, and it's a resident of the marsh too. And that's a good fish to see. This one's spawning. See the eggs? They're reproducing in the marsh, even in the cold. It's on the sea. These are what's called a rangia clam. It's a common 
clam that we have in the entire estuary. That's where all these shells are you see as we're sanding through. These things would be one of the first things impacted by oil because they're a filter feeder. Like the oysters that people are saying have been impacted, these are also, but there really isn't anybody that's looking at these. And I think this is an important thing that's being missed because it's the food chain for the blue crabs, which is a seafood industry. Do they so okay? These are healthy, they're solid, but you have to open them up and look at them to tell you know if they've accumulated anything toxic inside because they filter feed. And then when when you finish here, you go back to the lab. What do you do? We uh, you'll see. We put the, the samples in jars and the preserve, and they go back to the lab. And the grad students work up the collection. So the, the collection itself is a combination of multiple fish species. They're all sorted out by species in little groups, and then the uh, the fish are all measured individually for their lengths and their weights. And that goes into another data sheet that goes along with the one we're filling out here on board with the water quality parameters. And that is entered into a database as part of the long-term database we have set up. Okay, one, six, five, oh. In areas that were uh, uh, oiled, then we should be careful, and I believe that the, certainly our state is looking carefully. Because it would be far worse for us to certify the seafood as clean here and have somebody get very ill than uh, to, uh, to be uh, overly uh, cautious and just say it's not clean. They know what we're finding in the seafood. They was, know what we're finding in the seafood. Response. There's been no response to us directly. No response. Their response is on phone calls that they feel that they've done enough testing that it's safe and that it's adequate and it's, and it's okay for people to eat. But I've had fishermen sitting in this very room saying, I'm scared for my family because I feed them the seafood, and I'm scared for the people that I'm selling the seafood to. I don't want to hurt anybody. I, I love what I do. So there's a lot of fear there. They're worried about it. I don't know why the other folks aren't worried about it. When you look at what the federal agencies analyze for, they got the same basic results we did. It's what they did with the data. The Food and Drug Administration established specific levels for the BP spill. They called it the unprecedented spill, much too high a concentration for polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons. People along the northern Gulf of Mexico eat more than four jumbo shrimp at a serving, and they eat it multiple times during the week. They had the same kind of flaws for the uh, oysters, for the fin fish, for the crabs. If you just looked at their data, the federal agency data, 40 to 60 percent of the seafood was contaminated with PAHs, and yet they were saying no contamination. So interacting with the heads of these agencies at the federal level pointed out that there was contamination, but it was below their levels of concern. They changed the story and said there is contamination in the seafood, but it's below the levels of concern. Then they started using that data to open fishing grounds. So we'd be out on the edge of this marshy area collecting soil and sediment samples that were very oiled. And yet we'd see a shrimp boat 200 yards offshore trawling for shrimp. There have been a lot of research results that say there is none in the fish. Other uh, samples that I've seen analyzed that are outside of universities and federal agencies, uh, independent researchers have found high levels of toxins in fish, shrimp, oysters, and crabs. Why do you say outside universities and, and federal agencies? Why do you exclude them? 
because they are being paid by uh, either being controlled or being paid by uh, British Petroleum. Now the Gulf's back. Our shrimpers and fishermen are back on the water. Our beaches are clean. Just in time for spring break. And we're back to doing what we love, serving Gulf seafood. When people found out local shrimp was back on the menu, the phone rang and rang. Business gets better every day. We're making sure that tourists know they can come back. And we're open for business. I'm Brian Zarr. And I'm Brooke Zarr. And we own Restaurant Day for Me. We've got the best gumbo in town. But don't take our word for it. Give us a call. We'll save you a table by the window. I think there's a lot of pressure to make it less severe than it is. It's not only from the seafood aspect, but from the health impacts that are occurring. And I think that the federal agencies would like this to be attended to, and let's move on. Meanwhile, the people along the coast are being left very sick, severely impacted, and they have nowhere to turn. We've sampled approximately 50 people, sampled their blood for the volatile organics. The volatile organics that we're finding in their blood are the same that were in the BP crude and the dispersants, and they are the same that were detected in the air in the areas around the BP crude and dispersant. Αν εξαιρέσουμε κάποιε ομοσπονδιακέ υπηρεσίε, σήμερα κανεί δεν μπορεί να βάλει το χέρι του στη φωτιά για την ασφάλεια των θαλασσινών από τι μολυσμένε περιοχέ. Όταν η αλληλεία είναι ένα από του σημαντικότερου πυλώνε για την οικονομική ανάπτυξη στον Αμερικανικό Νότο και τα όρια συνεγερμού που θέτουν οι αρχέ για τη μόλυνση στα θαλασσινά τροποποιούνται ώστε τα αποτελέσματα να είναι πιο καθησυχαστικά, τότε το πιο κρίσιμο ερώτημα είναι αν μπορεί κανεί να φάει άφοβα μια μερίδα γαρίδε από τον κόλπο του Μεξικού. Δείτε πώ αντιδρούν οι ψαράδε, αλλά και τι απαντούν οι επιστήμονε που συναντήσαμε. The local media has carried very little. Baton Rouge paper, New Orleans paper, a little. New Iberia paper, no. So, and what they carry is sort of an overview, but not, not the specifics. They don't carry about how many people in their area of distribution are sick. Why? Because in Louisiana, oil is king. It is the underpinning of our economy. And what you don't want is you don't want to degrade the perception that the oil industry causes environmental problems. I can't tell you the number of times over the years I've been doing this kind of work where the federal agencies will come to me and say, you're creating a situation that we don't have the money to address the situation. It's all about how much it's going to cost to deal with the situation. BP is denying people's claims for illnesses, and some of them have hired attorneys but as you know, the attorney route is going to take a very, very long time. That does nothing for their situation now. Thank you. Amen.
Who are you representing? I'm representing uh, fishermen, um, hotels, resorts, property owners all along the affected areas. Are we talking about many people here? About a thousand right now. A thousand people. What are they asking? What are they asking? <laughs> they want to be compensated for their losses and injuries from the, from the oil spill. People, if they don't get adequate compensation for the claims process, need to be prepared to sue. And what are the most difficult claims? The most difficult claims are going to be those that are alleging personal injury or injury from exposure to the, the hydrocarbons that were being released uh, from the oil during the burning of the oil and also the off-gassing of the oil that went into the, the, the coastal communities. There are a lot of sick people and those are going to be the toughest cases. It's very easy to prove someone lost money. You show what they were making before and you show what they're making now and you can calculate that. But the, 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 the impact to human health is just huge. Um, there are a lot of sick people on the Gulf of Mexico. Well, right now we came offshore a few miles from, from the South Pass. We're in what we call the, the East Bay field, this oil field here. And it was found back in the late 40s, 50s. If you've looked around and seen thousands of small individual oil and gas wells and they all have pipelines that run into these bigger uh, collection stations uh, or pumping stations and uh, gathering stations. They all come into one central facility and then they're piped back in inland towards New Orleans which is 80 miles north of us from here. I think a few things have changed uh, at the policy level. The Obama administration has moved very aggressively to put new rules, new safety rules in place. They are putting many new safety requirements on the oil industry and they're going to, uh, to do much more uh, inspections uh, of the drilling operations. They're also going to require much stricter environmental reviews. I don't think industry has in place what's needed to, to quickly cut off a similar blowout uh, immediately the way it should. It has learned lessons of how to deal with exactly the same kind of accident more quickly, but it would still be weeks before something were cut off. So you, it wouldn't be three months, but it might be six weeks. Um, so there's been some more positive, but it's not where it should be yet. There is no way that you can uh, operate in this kind of an environment within a hundred percent surety that nothing's going to happen. And after the environmental impacts that we've seen, I think that we should rethink uh, allowing people to drill in areas with such high risk. One lesson that we hope will be learned from this is that we must, as a nation, as a world, as a civilization, if you will, make a transition to a clean energy future. We're burning almost a fourth of the oil that's produced worldwide, and we're less than 5% of the world's population. We have a problem. We have to deal with that. We have to reduce our reliance on this fuel. This catastrophe came from a sweet oil? Light sweet crude, yeah. Sweet is because it doesn't have a lot of uh, hydrogen sulfide and things that are, make it difficult to deal with. It's easy to refine, it's light, which means it has uh, not a lot of the heavier components, the thick gooey components. It's, it's got a lot of the, the gasoline side, if you will. So that it's, it's great for production of fuel. Are most of these rigs active? Yes, yes, all of them, all of them. If you get up close to them, you can actually hear the, the gas and the, and the oil the fluids are, uh, flowing through the pipelines. Is it okay for the fish? Yeah, the fish love it. It gives them a place to hide and grow up and feed and spawn. 
it's a, it's a great place. So fishing close to the rig is common. We always fish next to the rig. So the, the closer you can get to the rig, the better. And in fact, a lot of times when you hook a real big fish on next to one of these rigs, they'll go right back underneath and and cut your line off. So really, this is a fantastic fishery right here. Crazy thing is out here, you never know what kind of fish you're gonna catch. There may be 20 different species of fish down here. Yep. So what's your record? I've had some days where I've caught four, five, six hundred fish, just different species, different types. And, and you don't have any concerns that they might be contaminated somehow? No, I'm, I'm not really all that concerned about it. You know, the EPA and different federal agencies have been out here testing the water, testing the soil, testing the fish. Uh, it, I think if it was really bad or toxic, then then they would have shut everything down. Yeah. Seems like a big one. Yeah, that's a bigger fish. Oh, that's not a big fish. man what's this <laughs> this is a drum you eat that stuff uh i wouldn't eat one this big the smaller ones are much better eating Not very light either that's a big fish yeah, that's a big one. What we want to be certain is that if the oil gets into the food chain, um, will the fish remain safe to eat? We believe, we hope that it will, but we want good science to monitor the ocean conditions, uh, not just for a week or a month, but for several years, uh, because this is the only way to know for sure that the seafood will be safe. It'll be very interesting to see what ultimately happens, but I think if the state says the seafood's clean, then they're, they're testing it. I, I've been involved in discussions with the public health officials uh, throughout this bill, and they took this extremely seriously. My main fear is that some of the small fish that are very low on the food chain, or shrimp, or even crustacea, will not recover from the oil spill, and then everything that depends on them for food will starve to death, even if they had no problem from the actual oil from the spill. The gulf is very large. The spill did cover a large area, but the by far, the majority of the Gulf was totally unaffected by oil. I mean, the shores of Texas were not affected. The vast majority of Florida was unaffected by it. So uh, there's no question that, that, that these areas are safe uh, to take seafood from. Do you eat seafood? I do and I cross my fingers and hope for the best. I think, I, I do believe the reports that most of the seafood's okay. I, I also know that not all the seafood I eat is coming from Louisiana anymore. But I don't, I don't ask for a, a passport when I see a shrimp. If it's on my plate, I eat it. I would be very cautious about what seafood is consumed from the Gulf. I would also be very cautious of where it came from and 
what process was it brought in to a reputable dealer? I think that there isn't enough data to tell us one way or the other. I think that I would err on the side of caution. If, if people ask me, do I eat the seafood right now? No, I don't. Do you still eat seafood from the Gulf? I, I don't anymore. After getting my blood sample results back and finding high levels of ethyl benzene, I avoid shrimp and fish from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, during the first three months, I would have eaten anything out of the Gulf of Mexico, but not anymore. Right now, I have been enjoying here in New Orleans various freshwater fish and crawfish which are in season. I would say that in a three or four or five years, I would be willing to eat um, fish from the Gulf of Mexico. That seems to be the timeline from other spills.